Hi everyone, I'm back today with a beloved contemporary classic by celebrated British-Japanese author and winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature, Kazuo Ishiguro. I've never read anything by Ishiguro before, although I did watch the movie adaptation of his work Never Let Me Go a few years back. But in my couple years now of watching other people's YouTube reviews of literature, I've seen this book, The Remains of the Day, praised several times, beginning with a stellar review by Ashley from Climb the Stacks, and then finally culminating recently in a review by John David from a few months ago um, that just finally convinced me I needed to prioritize this book. A lot of people, including those I just mentioned, described it as one of their favorite books or one of the best things they've read in years. Of course, with such praise, I went into this book with considerably high expectations, which can either enhance my excitement further in reading a book or can create an almost unachievable goal. For this book, though, I was not disappointed. While I wouldn't personally rate this book as an outlier among everything I've read recently, it was at least among the best that I've read this year. In Remains of the Day, we follow an English butler, Mr. Stevens, who seems to be in his late to middle age, a seasoned butler of many years, but also probably with at least a few good years left ahead of him still. Stevens takes enormous pride in his years of service to his former employer, the influential Lord Darlington of the mansion Darlington Hall. But now, following the illness and death of Lord Darlington just a few years ago, Stevens finds himself at a bit of a professional and, as we learn, personal crossroads, as he finds himself serving a new master, the American Mr. Faraday, facing new expectations, fewer support staff, and what he sees as an overall loss of professionalism amongst other English butlers and domestic service workers. He struggles with a vague understanding that some change is inevitable, but this understanding is hard to reconcile internally with his more traditional notions of what makes a great butler, an ideal that he has always aspired to in his own modest way, or at least he sees it as modest. We learn about the ins and outs of butlering and of Stephen's life and career, all of which are inextricably linked as he takes a week-long road trip across the south of England from the fictional manor Darlington Hall in Oxfordshire over to the western coast via Wiltshire, Dorset, Somerset, Devon, and I think by the end all the way to Cornwall. As he narrates the present tales of his journey and his experiences traveling, we soon see that his mind is really elsewhere as he reflects upon the successes of his career and by extension of his life, since his career is such an integral part of his identity. We travel with him through reminiscences about roads taken and roads not taken. As a quick aside, I'm not going to reveal any big spoilers for this first half of the review, and I'll tell you before I get to them. As is often the case, this isn't a super spoilable book, but if you want to really experience the book fully, anything I tell you might be a bit of a minor spoiler, so keep that in mind if you're going to watch this review at all before reading. The Remains of the Day shines the most for its development of its central character, Mr. Stevens, and the skillful style in which author Ishiguro conveys a feeling of nostalgia along with all the good and bad and neutral that come with it, while exploring plenty of other questions and ideas that are mostly left open to interpretation by the readers. If you are going to read it, I recommend you approach it in a mindset eager to learn about a single character, because while we do see a chronological narrative of Stevens' life that we gather throughout the book as he reminisces, the events we witness function not so much in service of a greater plot, but rather in revealing Stephen's perspective on life and how he's changed, or in many ways not changed, through his years of butlering. Due to the protracted narrative style in which Stevens recounts critical life moments to us as if he's recording his thoughts in a journal, we're never going to see anything near a complete picture because we're seeing it necessarily selectively interpreted through the lens of Stephen's focus, including through the distortions of his own memory. I love this kind of narration, and it's done very well. But when combined with a few other key attributes of Ishiguro's style, I did hear that many people who weren't expecting this kind of a story, and even some who were, including a few of my family members who read it along with me, found it a painfully slow read. The things we learn about Stevens always seem a little besides the point of what he's literally telling us, because he himself is struggling to interpret the significance of past events, uh, to understand his identity as a person, and to what extent he's capable of changing that, if at all. This book was especially fun for me in that it really is a historical fiction novel, even though that's not necessarily its main selling point. Stevens' employer, Lord Darlington, is effectively somewhat of a diplomat, and many important real characters from history, including some you'll recognize, make their ways through Darlington Hall across the years of Stevens' employment there, a point in which Stevens takes great pride. Although the historical plot is never central to the plot of the novel, it is important as we see some of the diplomatic struggles and political disagreements from the post-World War I era through the post-World War II era, all playing out in the background as Stevens just does his best to provide excellent service, which gives him a real sense of importance as he has some vague sense of just how critical the events must be that are unfolding in the rooms of Darlington Hall, which wouldn't be possible without him working tirelessly behind the scenes. We quickly start to see a little bit of a contrast between what Stephen states he values and what he actually seems to value in the stories he describes, 
In a memorable scene for me towards the beginning of the novel, Stevens begins his reflections on what makes a great butler. He surmises that a great butler is great in the same way that Great Britain is great. Not through showiness or panache, in fact Stevens portrays a certain disdain for butlers of that flashy type who are forgotten just as quickly as they are ever first noticed, but rather a great butler shines through a quiet dignity, through being excellent in a way that you'd only ever notice if you really stopped to look. And through a clever stylistic choice, Ishiguro writes the novel in such a way that even Stevens' storytelling reveals important life lessons and turning points, but all through a series of rambling and often seemingly irrelevant reflections on details such as the importance of frequently polishing the household silver, or how to approach a table in a dimly lit room so as to minimize the likelihood that one's shadow will startle the diners. Still, although this definition of quiet greatness or quiet dignity aptly characterizes Stephen's philosophy of butlering and his professional practices in many ways, he still certainly demonstrates a fair bit of butler elitism as he reflects, for example, on the criteria for inclusion in the Hayes Society, an exclusive group of butlers with selection criteria that he claims not to care about but also apparently agrees with, aside from some relatively minor quibbles. He maintains a great sense of self-importance throughout the novel for being a butler of such an important figure as Laura Darlington, sometimes to the point of condescension when considering other butlers of less distinguished households. And this internal contradiction becomes especially clear later on in the novel when we see him in a situation where he's mistaken for an actual lord, which he fails to correct, but he also becomes incredibly uncomfortable the longer this confusion goes on. I love the way in which this novel explores what happens when our experiences challenge our own notion of our core identity. All of us, to varying extents, have certain qualities, values, and preferences that we're willing to adapt and change about ourselves, but other ones that we consider a core aspect of who we are. And with those core aspects, such as with Stephen's aspiration to dignity and professionalism, we often fail to question why it is that these things are so important to us, and thus we become confused or even agitated when we experience events that seem to challenge these core parts of our essence. Perhaps we even stubbornly adhere to them even though it would be hard in a strictly logical sense to explain why we should, or we mistake for core values certain qualities that really aren't so crucial to who we are. This leads to all these funny little contradictions and sometimes even traps us, because the discomfort of being forced to change our own self-conception, our idea of our core values, feels like it's just not worth whatever the benefit might be. And this isn't always such a bad thing, it has its positives and its negatives, but one positive aspect is that it allows us a sense of internal consistency, a pride in who we are, whatever that means, a feeling of purpose. As a silly but hopefully illustrative little example, I personally attended a university with a lot of high achievers, and many of us, myself included, took pride in achieving basically perfect grades in every class we took up through high school. But when taking challenging classes, often multiple at the same time, we soon realized that the standards we had set for ourselves early in our lives, and that had worked well for us at the time, suddenly became impossible to live up to. Or rather, they didn't become absolutely impossible, at least in the short term, but maintaining perfection would have often required sacrifices in our interpersonal relationships, mental health, and overall well-being. To some extent for me, and to a really great extent for others, it was hard to face up to the fact that as much as being a good student felt like a core part of my identity, maybe in fact being a good student wasn't actually a core part of my identity. Or more precisely, maybe being a good student reflected certain core parts of my identity, like self-discipline, curiosity for knowledge, and a desire to make the most of my skills and talents. But being a good student wasn't itself the core. And as such, I had to reshape my notion of self-identity in such a way that I could still stay true to my real core values, even if it meant achieving mediocre grades in a few classes. And this push and pull between staying the same and being open to change, between a rigid definition of our values and a more flexible exploration of what those might mean, applies to so many parts of our identities as we grow and reshape our self-conception throughout our lives. In fact, in a sense, I think this tension exemplifies both the value and the dangers of conservatism. Not so much in a political way, but in more of an ideological sense. This resistance to change in favor instead of what we believe has worked for us reasonably well thus far. If it ain't broke, why fix it, especially if it would take a lot of effort and it feels risky to do so. This novel is also saturated with nostalgia, and Kazuo Ishiguro once said that one of his own goals in this writing is to capture a unique texture of memory. A clear theme in this novel is the tension between clinging to the past, whether this means remembering our best moments or wishing we could change our worst ones, 
uh, versus focusing on the present, looking towards the future, and even just leaving the past behind. And while some might argue that there's no use whatsoever in dwelling on the past, the setup of this novel also reminds us that we could never really fully escape the past either. Nostalgia can be dangerous when it distracts us too fully from where we are right now, but who would we even be without our past? After all, it's only through the lens of our past experiences that the present ones even contain their fullest meaning to us. We should appreciate and remember what remains of days gone by, so long as it doesn't stop us from also experiencing what remains of our days ahead. From this point on, I just want to warn you that I'm going to talk a little bit about some parts that will contain spoilers. So here's your cue to skedaddle if you uh, don't want any major spoilers. Many people also seem to have found this novel hard to read because of its lack of emotion, or rather because of Stephen's insistence on suppressing his emotions to the extent that even he himself is not really aware of why he's feeling uncomfortable afterwards about the decisions he makes. Although I found a lot to be admired in Stephen's concept of dignity, his precise definition of this trait requires suppression of any emotion that might interfere with one's professional duties. And in Stephen's case, since he's practically always on duty, at least whenever he's interacting with another person, this means he's chosen to detach from his emotional experiences entirely. I have to say this is something I found fairly relatable as someone who has often held so strongly to certain aspects of my identity, things that I considered core values, that I refused to show my emotions or even acknowledge them to myself, instead simply striving to behave, express myself, and even feel the way that I thought I should be feeling. And it's only really been in the past few years of my life that I've come to realize, on one hand, yes, I still do believe that it is an incredibly admirable act to adhere to your duties and responsibilities to others and your commitment to your core values, even when this means having to put on a facade of composure when things aren't really okay. But I've also learned that I need to be more aware of when I'm doing this so that I'm not fooling even myself, and so that I can acknowledge that things aren't all just okay and that I can't ignore this forever. And Probably even more importantly, that in some cases, as we see when Stevens tries to act to Miss Kenton as if he's a robot that's unperturbed even by the death of his own father, something that I think she sees right through, by the way, on some occasions we might think that we're helping others by hiding our struggles from them, when in fact those struggles could be the very basis of a personal connection, something to be celebrated rather than something to be concealed. It's because of this emotional suppression that characterizes basically the entire novel that at the end of the book we have a few incredibly powerful moments, moments that would feel totally unremarkable to me if occurring in a different story. Lots of people mention just how heartbroken they were when Miss Kenton reveals to Stevens that she imagined herself having married him instead. Here Stevens lets on to the readers that he deeply regrets the loss of this possibility, all while retaining a sense of dignity and composure in his interaction with Miss Kenton, encouraging her not to look to the past. I personally feel that in this case, Stephen's response and muting of his emotions was somewhat admirable, as he seems to have realized that the two of them will never be able to turn back time and change the fact that both of them have now moved on. And he seems to be accepting this fact and encouraging Miss Kenton to do the same achieving a certain sense of closure. In fact, the part that moved me the most occurred a few minutes earlier. First of all, I didn't even think that Stevens ever was going to reunite with Miss Kenton at all. I thought he was going to change his mind and drive home right at the very end. Ishiguro actually leaves Stevens' intentions here ambiguous, since in the end it was she who came to meet him at the hotel, rather than him actively choosing to meet her. And then once they do have the chance to talk with one another, I was absolutely shocked and touched late into the conversation when Stevens reveals he wants to ask Miss Kenton a question of a personal nature, namely whether she's happy in her marriage. Remember, this is Stevens, the devoted professional who only came here to Miss Kenton to see if she was interested in returning to work at Darlington Hall, not because he had any personal business with her. Stevens, whose entire identity rests on the idea that he must suppress his emotions and personal feelings for the good of others, and if we're being honest, because it would be uncomfortable to him to do otherwise. And he's decided to ask a personal question. Although we don't know for sure what happened between them in the past, to our knowledge, this is the first time Stevens has ever acknowledged that there was any sort of personal understanding or relationship between himself and Miss Kenton, anything more than a strictly professional association. And to me, this was huge because it's a thing that seems so small, and yet I also personally understand just how hard it can be to acknowledge openly that you have feelings. It's a sign that Stevens, at least in this moment, has finally made the slightest little effort to change as a person, to consider whether his definition of dignity as a person might be worth tweaking even in the slightest way. I don't know if it's really possible for me to even communicate how meaningful that point right there was for me, but to me that was the culmination of the novel and of Stephen's journey, and it made me feel incredibly happy for him. 
which is a little odd because most people I've seen discussing this novel seem to have read it as more of a tragedy, a tale of what could have been, of a man who wasted his life, constrained by the shackles of his self-imposed limitations and misguided notion of dignity, and who to the very end is too cowardly to really express himself to the woman he could have, he should have married. I understand this reading, and I agree that there's certainly a prominent tone of sadness and regret in this reunion of Stevens with Miss Kenton. But to me, the ending of this novel was equally, if not more, a happy and optimistic one, one in which a man begins to come to terms with feelings and decisions he's ignored for a long time, and in which he has an opportunity for a second chance. And by second chance here, I don't even mean to suggest that his life up to this point has been wasted or meaningless, because I don't think it has been. I mean that it's an opportunity to seize the best of what remains ahead in his life, instead of spending the rest of his days clinging to his increasingly untenable idea of dignity and to the idea of how things might have been. Maybe that's part of why this novel is so beloved by so many readers, though. It says something different to different people and invites plenty of deep discussions. And to me, it also remains even an open question to the very end whether Stevens really did waste his life up through the time at which the book takes place. He certainly seems to believe so after it all comes loose at the end of the novel, in a sobbing realization that he didn't even make his own mistakes, and yet, I personally think he's too hard on himself. Or is it not hard enough? I, what I mean is, to me, he certainly did make plenty of his own mistakes, if you call them that. And this realization that he might have done things differently in the past if he could go back is not a sign his life was wasted, but a creation of meaning in these past experiences, a beginning to learn from them. But I also suspect that a lot of readers' interpretations of how well Stevens spent his life may also depend on their own life priorities and the extent to which they can empathize with what he most valued. For example, we might argue that Stevens valued loyalty in his career as butler at the expense of all other good things in life, but who are we to really define what makes someone else's life good? Stevens himself offers an alternative perspective when he comments on what a waste it is for a young housemaid with such promise and prospects of serving in an excellent household to instead leave the profession to go off and get married, the same decision that Miss Kenton herself will eventually make. To me, it's hardly obvious that uh, this path of prioritizing marriage and starting a family is any better than the path that Stevens chose. They're just different paths, and it's up to each of us to decide what's right for us. If anything, the sad part for me is not that a man could choose to prioritize professionalism and dignity over emotional connection and relationships and romance. It's more that you could probably argue, since he never even knew what it was he was missing and never felt comfortable exploring uh, what it might look like. He never knew the alternative, so it was less of a free choice than one of simply following the default path he saw right in front of him. And yet still, how many of the things I've done in my life are things that I chose without really being able to see every possible alternative path? Knowing what I know now, I absolutely would have done some things differently in my life, but for me that's kind of besides the point, because the fact is I just didn't know the alternatives at the time. So what use is it to regret those past decisions? Exploring one other possible objection, though, maybe Stephen's life was a waste not because he prioritized professionalism, but because he spent it serving a man who he believed to be someone changing the world for the better, and instead is forced to reckon with the fact that Lord Darlington contributed to a lot of suffering. And this interpretation is totally fair, although personally I don't completely buy into it. I can see why Stevens himself would have been distressed to learn that his master was not as great of a man as Stevens believed him to be especially since the very acknowledging of this fact seems like a little bit of a betrayal to his employer, something that goes against Stephen's core values. Still, Stevens tells us time and time again that he is a man of dignity and a man of service, and it's hard to dispute that he provided that service. True, the guy he provided it for ended up doing some bad things, but does that cheapen the service that Stevens provided? In the Christian Gospels, for example, Jesus serves both sinners and saints without distinction. I guess, though, that how we interpret the value of Stephen's service may depend a lot on whether we consider him merely a servant or actually an enabler of injustice. Did he have power or agency, for example, when he promptly dismissed the two Jewish employees from his staff under his master's orders? This certainly gets trickier, and one might argue for either perspective here, that Stevens was simply unable to question orders or that he was complicit by refusing to challenge his master on this point. So the writing style of this book is excellent, and Ishiguro is a master of his craft in so many of the ways I've touched on already. There is, however, one thing that struck me as a little bit awkward. Uh, now, who am I to criticize a Nobel Prize winner? But also, everyone has a right to criticize any writing, no matter how celebrated the author is, so I'll say it. For a novel that, like the finest of butlers, is great through quiet dignity, there were two scenes toward the end that I found just a little bit too flashy, where Ishiguro tipped his hand just a bit too much. 
For me, these scenes in which Ishiguro seems to dramatically confirm things that we may have already suspected dampened the ultimate power of the book just a tiny bit by spelling out the message instead of letting readers come to the final conclusions, or inconclusive ambiguities themselves. The less obtrusive of these two scenes, in my opinion, was the final diplomatic scene in which Lord Darlington receives a visit from Herr Ribbentrop, whom historians will immediately recognize as the notorious Nazi German diplomat. If you don't know of Ribbentrop, he basically is infamous for manipulating the members of what would eventually become the Allied powers to persuade them that Germany was not a real threat to them, all before things eventually escalated into World War II. I recognize his name from some of my Soviet history reading as the namesake of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, in which German agreed not to attack the Soviet Union, that is of course until they later did just that. To put it simply, Ribbentrop ended up on the wrong side of history by, you know, being a high-ranking and unapologetic Nazi. Now by this point, we've already seen some serious red flags about Lord Darlington's political allegiances, not enough to be certain that he's an all-out fascist, which I'd argue even by the end of the book that he was not, but at least that he was sort of a fool. This was beautifully foreshadowed too in a much earlier scene in the novel where the shady-seeming American Mr. Lewis rudely calls Lord Darlington and his French counterpart Monsieur Dupont a bunch of amateurs. Though I myself enthusiastically took the side of Darlington and Dupont at the time, the events that transpired afterwards have gradually revealed to us by this point that Lord Darlington's English professionalism and courtesy to England's defeated German opponents have translated into an overall lack of courage to question the political developments transpiring before him. This is all shown really well in my opinion, up until the scene in which the journalist, Mr. Cardinal, calls Stevens into a little secret conference to explain to him all that we may have already inferred, that his master Lord Darlington has effectively become a pawn of the Germans and a Nazi sympathizer. I'll give this explanatory scene a pass though, just because although this will probably be apparent by this point to those who have studied this period of history, to many readers and to Stevens himself, this knowledge would not necessarily be so obvious. It still felt a little bit clunky to me, though, in how it was exposed in this scene, although I do have to give Ishiguro credit for at least leaving it to the reader to interpret to what extent Darlington is a true villain as opposed to a fool or an amateur, and to assess what level of guilt, if any, Stevens should take upon himself for serving such a man unquestioningly, when, aside from a few exceptional cases, we couldn't have really expected him to understand the full gravity of the situation. The other exception, though, is that I think the final scene at the pier included a lot that shouldn't have been there. I had decided pretty early on in the novel that the title, The Remains of the Day, served a double meaning, on one hand referring to our desire to hold on to the best of the past, and on the other hand to the value of making the most of what's left of our days, even thinking of our lives as a single metaphorical day. So for me, when Stevens speaks with an older man on the pier who tells him transparently, the evening's the best part, it felt as if despite that Ishiguro had already made this point, in my opinion, perfectly, he then couldn't resist pointing it out to us just to make sure we understood, look, you see, because your life is like a day, and the evening is like what's left of it. So you have to make the most of the evening because you haven't seen evening yet. You know, like it's the end of your life, wink, wink. So you don't know what it's going to be like yet. Others might disagree with me on this, but this is the one part of the novel where I'll stand by my claim that Ishiguro was too flashy in his presentation, throwing in a bit of Victoria Falls amidst all the humble and dignified English landscapes of the rest of his writing, if you know what I mean. Still, it's a minor thing in the big picture of this novel, especially since I saw so much to enjoy in the story. That's all I've got. Okay, well, it was a lot, so it had better be all I've got. What did you think, though? Uh, what did I miss? Did you like it or did you find it boring? Leave me a comment or subscribe if you want to hear me talk about more books. Uh, and until next time, bye and happy reading.